Good morning, and welcome to this privilege update presentation hosted by BCL Legal. My name is James Quinn, and I'm a director in the dispute resolution team at Voice uh, Turner Solicitors in Reading. In my presentation this morning, I'll run through four interesting cases in the Commercial Court and Court of Appeal from 2021, in which rulings have been given on different aspects of the law of privilege. In 2020, we saw the landmark ruling on legal advice privilege in JET 2 and the Civil, Avian, Civil Aviation Authority in which the Court of Appeal held that for legal advice privilege to apply, a dominant purpose test needed to be satisfied, i.e. that the seeking or giving of legal advice must be the dominant purpose of the communication. Though there haven't been any landmark cases on quite that level this year, cases which I'll run through today are significant nonetheless, and they've arisen in interesting scenarios which should, as always, give us all pause for thought on privilege issues during our day-to-day -day work. I'll finish just before 9.30, so if you'd like to ask any questions, please feel free to email these over and I'll come back to you afterwards. Before I move on to the four cases, first I'd like to touch base very briefly on the final aspect of a long running dispute about privilege in the case of Sports Direct International, which is now Fraser's group, and the Financial Reporting Council. This case focused on the question of legal advice privilege in the context of regulatory proceedings. In 2020, the Court of Appeal ruled on various aspects of privilege, and one issue on which it rules was whether pre-existing non-privileged documents attached to privileged emails were also privileged by simply by virtue of being attached to privileged emails. Put another way, were the email and the attachment to be treated as a single document for the purpose of legal professional privilege? As we see on the slide, the Court of Appeal held that just because the email itself is privileged does not confer privilege on the pre-existing document. Sports Direct applied to the Supreme Court Commission to Appeal this issue. In January this year, the Supreme Court decided that Sports Direct application, Sports Direct's application did not raise an arguable point of law, so the Court of Appeal's decision on this point remains valid. The first case we'll look at is the State of Qatar and Bonk Haviland, which was a decision of the Commercial Court on an application by the claimant who had sought an order in relation to the defendant's disclosure. The issue in the case was whether a report prepared by PwC and drafts of it were protected by litigation privilege. The claimant in this case is the state of Qatar. The first defendant is Bonk Haviland, which is a Luxembourg incorporated bank with a branch office in London. And the second defendant is a Mr. Bowley, who was employed in the bank's London office until 9th of November 2017. Looking at the background facts, on 5th of June 2017, a number of Arab nations severed diplomatic ties with and instituted various measures against the state of Qatar, including the closing of borders. This became known as the blockade. The state of Qatar's conspiracy claim in this litigation is that a number of parties entered into a conspiracy to further the policy reflected in the blockade. The alleged aim of the conspiracy was to attack the Qatar economy and to cause financial harm to Qatar by firstly manipulating the market in the currency issued by the Qatar Central Bank, the QAR, and secondly to exert pressure on the pegged exchange rate maintained by the central bank between the QAR and the US dollar. And by manipulating the market in US dollar denominated debt instruments it issued by Qatar, and thirdly, by manipulating the market in US dollar denominated bonds issued by Qatar. Qatar made these allegations against a number of Saudi and UAE banks, and actions in New York and London against all banks currently stayed pending potential settlement. Qatar has alleged that Bonk Haviland and Mr. Bowley are participants in the alleged conspiracy. The main allegation is based on a seven page slide presentation prepared by Mr. Bowley in 2017 while he was employed by the bank called Distressed Countries Fund. The presentation described certain aspects of manipulative trading. The origin, nature and purpose of the presentation and the extent to which it was disseminated and acted upon by the bank are matters for trial. The report was apparently leaked to the press and it was featured in detail and in a colorful, colorful manner on a US website called The Intercept. Qatar brought a claim in tort for unlawful means conspiracy, unlawful purpose conspiracy and causing loss by unlawful means. The bank and Mr. Bowley have denied being a party to any conspiracy, and the bank denied that it took any steps to establish a cell company and carried out no material trades in QAR or US dollar Qatari bonds. During the proceedings, the bank gave details about the purpose and background to the preparation of the presentation. No steps were taken in relation to the presentation between its preparation in September 2017 until it was later made public in October and November 2017. The parties gave disclosure in the course of the proceedings. The main focus of the application for disclosure concerned a report which had been prepared for the bank by PwC. Following the publication of the article about the presentation on the Intercept website, the bank, through its Luxembourg lawyers, instructed PwC to carry out what was described at the time as a forensic or IT investigation. The key issue in the application was the status of PwC's investigation, 
and whether its report was subject to litigation privilege, which had been asserted by the bank. The PwC report had been commissioned by the bank's Luxembourg lawyers to investigate how the presentation had been prepared, the extent to which it had been disseminated and how it was leaked publicly. The bank submitted a witness statement from one of its executives explaining the background to the matter and the steps and decisions that were taken in order to explain its claim to privilege over the PwC report. The judge analysed this evidence and explanation in very fine detail in order to determine whether the test for litigation privilege had been met. We've set out on the slide a chronology of the main events from the publication of the Intercept article on the 9th of November 2017, leading up to the production of the PwC report on 7th of June 2018, and which was then provided to the CCF and the FCA shortly thereafter. As we see, see on the slide, there was a flurry of activity in mid-November with communications with the CCF, uh, CSSF, which is the Luxembourg financial regulator, uh, communications with the FCA and instructing PwC to investigate. On 14th of December 2017, the bank received a letter from US lawyers for the Central Qatar Bank asking the bank to impose a litigation hold on documents. The claimant advanced a number of arguments in challenging the bank's claim to privilege over the PwC report and associated working papers. First, it is submitted the bank had failed to demonstrate that when the PwC report was commissioned and produced, there was a reasonable prospect of adversarial proceedings either from the CSSF, the FCA, or emanations of the state of Qatar. <clears throat> Secondly, it argued that on the evidence, the prospect of action by the FCA or the state of Qatar was not a part of the bank's thinking when it instructed PwC, and there was no evidence on what type of regulatory action in Luxembourg was in prospect. There was insufficient evidence of adversarial proceedings. Further, it argued that there was no evidence that the report was prepared solely for the purpose of conducting those proceedings, and that the evidence indicated that there were various other purposes. The claimant also submitted that the litigation privilege doesn't protect a document which was always intended to be and was produced to the CSSF, which the bank considers to be the claimant in that any adversarial proceedings. The bank argued that because of the Intercept article, it reasonably anticipated adversarial proceedings by the CSSF, FCA, or the state of Qatar. And as we see on the slide, the evidence of the bank's executive is that this was regarded as a serious matter by the bank. It also argued that following the letter on 14 December 2017 from the law firm Paul Weiss, the bank was considering its legal exposure. It said that the purpose of instructing PwC was that the findings of the investigation would allow the bank's Luxembourg lawyers to advise us as to possible liability and to assist the bank in dealing with the CSSF. They had, it argued, through no waiver of privilege or any limited waiver of privilege in the PwC report, and sending a copy to the CSSF and FCA. There was much common ground between the parties on the required elements of litigation privilege. We set out on the slide the test from the House of Lords decision from Three Rivers in 2004, referred to by the parties, namely that litigation must be in progress or contemplation. Communications must be for the sole or dominant purpose of conducting that litigation. And the litigation must be adversarial, not investigative or inquisitorial. In summary, the judge held that the PwC report and the associated working papers were not protected by litigation privilege. He considered that when working out the sole or dominant purpose for which the report was produced, the bank's state of mind was the most important factor. And the key moment was on 13 November 2017 when PwC was instructed to carry out its work and produce its report. The judge thought that subsequent events, such as the Paul Weiss letter on 14 December 2017 and the FCA's letter on 15 February 2018, were not material, and that there was no evidence that the dominant purpose of the bank engaging the PwC have changed. Whilst the judge accepted the bank regarded the matter as being serious, the bank's evidence was that the matter could have significant legal regulatory consequences. He found that this was far too general to support the claim for litigation privilege. The judge found that something more concrete is needed albeit litigation does not need to be likely. The judge then analysed the position as of 13 November 2017 when PwC was instructed and leading up to the production of the PwC report in 20, June 2018, as against the three bodies against whom it was alleged that adversarial proceedings were contemplated, i.e. the CSSF, the FCA and the Qatar Central Bank. Taking first the CSSF, as we see on the slide, the judge's view the evidence put forward by the bank was that there was insufficient evidence to suggest that the CSSF's position was regarded as hostile or that adversarial regulatory proceedings were regarded by the bank as reasonably in contemplation. Indeed, the judge found that on the evidence the opposite was the case. He concluded that the CSSF's involvement did not go beyond the investigative stage 
and that although one cannot judge matters with hindsight, the fact was that no proceedings were brought and no sanctions were imposed by the CSSF. Moving on to consider potential adversarial proceedings by the FCA, the judge concluded that the evidence was extremely thin. First, there had been no contact with the FCA before PWC was instructed on 13 November. And the bank's evidence was that the letter received from the FCA on 18th of February 2018 emphasised the importance of PWC's findings to allow it to respond effectively to the FCA. However, the judge considered that this fell far short of an anticipation of adversarial proceedings. The judge also dismissed the suggestion that the bank anticipated litigation by the Qatar Central Bank. He noted that the first contact with the Qatar Central Bank was only on 14 December 2017, and that there was no evidence of any claim of any fear of a claim from the Qatar Central Bank when PwC was instructed on 13 November. Further, he concluded that the bank's evidence in relation to the litigation hold from Paul Weiss did not suggest that the bank anticipated a claim by the Qatar Central Bank. In the judge's overall conclusion, as we've set out on the slide, he wasn't satisfied that the PwC was, uh, report was produced for the sole purpose, or indeed the dominant purpose, of anticipated adversarial litigation. He concluded that the most prominent and dominant reasons for the preparation of the report were to find out the facts about the creation of the presentation and how it had been obtained from the bank's files, and to satisfy the CSSF and to enable the bank to answer the CSF's questions. The test for establishing litigation privilege had therefore not been met. This is a very interesting judgment. First, it contains a very detailed analysis of the earlier authorities on litigation privilege and the various required elements of it. And so if you're looking into litigation privilege in detail, then this is a very helpful reference point for all the main authorities. Secondly, the references in the test for litigation privilege as to the sole or dominant purpose and the contemplation of adversarial, adversarial proceedings is well known. However, it is not always easy to work out if these elements have been satisfied in actual cases. And this judgment is instructive to see the court's forensic approach to analyzing and determining whether the tests have been met. So on our second case, we'll now look at the Court of Appeal decision uh, in Victory Game and Hujo Investments, which is another case concerning litigation privilege. In this case, the issue is whether certain correspondence was protected by litigation privilege, and if so, whether such privilege should be lost because of the way in which the privileged information had been obtained. Starting then with the background, the case concerned a disputed commercial property transaction. Hujo had purchased commercial premises in Southall from Victory Game, and the ground floor of the premises had been rented out for retail purposes. Contracts were exchanged in March 2016, and the transaction was completed in August 2018. And Mr. Jandu from law firm Stradbrooks acted for Hujo in the transaction. Hujo claimed that there had been fraudulent or neg negligent misrepresentation by Victory Game about the duration of the leases and the rental income. A schedule given by Victory Game, by Victory Game to Hujo stated that the tenants had signed 15 year leases. However, the durations were in fact only six years and nine months. Victory Game accepted that there had been misrepresentation, but that this had been an innocent mistake. Further, they asserted that Hooja would have known about the true duration of the leases at the time of the exchange of contracts, as the original lease documents had been given to Victory Game's selling agents, who would then pass them on to Hooja's solicitor, Stradbrooks. Victory Game alleged that Mr. Chandra of Stradbrooks would have inspected the leases before he passed them back to Victory Game's solicitors and advised Ahuja about them. In their view, Mr. Jandu's uh, advice to Ahuja about the duration of the leases was a critical issue in the main claim. As part of the proceedings, Victory Game made uh, an application for disclosure of two documents. These were firstly a letter of claim sent by Cardian Law acting for Ahuja against Ahuja's former solicitor, Stradbrooks, and secondly, a response to the letter of claim from Stradbrooks professional indemnity advisors. Ahuja asserted that the correspondence was covered by litigation privilege. Cardium Law had replaced Stradbrooks as Ahuja's solicitors in December 2018. They asked Stradbrooks to provide their files on the matter, both before and after a claim had been commenced against Victory Game in May 2019. However, Stradbrooks refused to provide it. Cardium Law therefore applied for and successfully obtained a third party disclosure order against Stradbrooks in November 2019, and Stradbrooks handed over their conveyance in file. A solicitor from Cardium Law, a Mr. Davies, provided a witness statement in the proceedings explaining the steps which they took and the rationale for those steps. Ahuja wanted further information from Stradbrooks and Mr. Jandu about their handling of the matter. And given Stradbrooks' uncooperative stance, Cardian Law sent a letter before action 
to Stradbrooks on 10th of February 2020, although Ahuja had given no instructions to commence proceedings. Hardy and Law's evidence was that the dominant purpose of their letter for action was to obtain information relevant to these proceedings, but which was not apparent from the conveyancing file. Their evidence was that the response received from Stradbrooks PI insurers in December 2020 contained the information which they had sought. <clears throat> The application for disclosure of the correspondence first came before Master Pester in the High Court. He did not want to go behind what Mr. Davies had said in his witness statement. He concluded that the two lists had not come into existence for the dominant purpose of being used in the litigation, because the dominant purpose is not determined solely by one, what one party says it is. Hooja appealed this decision to a judge in the High Court. It argued that the master was wrong to hold that the dominant purpose test was to be applied from the point of view of a third party recipient of the communication. Instead, it is the intention of the party claiming privilege, which is the only consideration. And Mr. Robin Boss, sitting as a Deputy High Court Judge, concluded that in determining the dominant purpose, the main focus was on the position of the litigant claiming privilege, i.e. victory gain. He found that the relevant purpose was the purpose uh, who was the instigator of the document, and that the purpose of the person must be determined objectively based on all the evidence, including their subjective intention. There is no challenge to Mr. Davies' evidence that the dominant purpose of the letter was to obtain information for the present proceedings, even though the judge acknowledged that the letter could be evidence that Ahuja was considering a professional negligence claim against Stradbrooks. Having established that the dominant purpose of the letter of claim was to obtain information for use in the present proceedings, the judge went on to consider whether there had been an element of deception by Ahuja, and if so, whether this impacted upon the privileged status of the correspondent. We've set out on the slide the judge's comments on this issue. And we see his view that there clearly was an element of deception in that the purpose of the letter before claim was to make Stradbrooks believe that they were facing a claim for professional negligence and that they were therefore obliged to provide the information. <clears throat> however, however, whilst the judge didn't condone Ahuja's tactics, he found that there was no principled reason why the information obtained should not be protected by litigation privilege. Victory Game appealed further to the Court of Appeal. It was not given permission to appeal on the judge's finding that when determining the dominant purpose of the communication, the relevant consideration is the purpose of the party which has instigated the correspondence rather than the recipient of it. However, it was given permission to appeal on two other grounds. First, Victory Game appealed on the ground that the judge had been wrong to find that there was no principle of law to the effect that if a party misleads another as to the purpose for which information is required, then the requesting party can't then maintain, maintain privilege over the information and that this, is, this also applies to third parties and not just to parties to litigation. Secondly, they submitted that the judge had been wrong in law to hold that objectively assessed Hooja's purpose in instigating the correspondence was for the dominant purpose of the present litigation. The Court of Appeal dismissed the ground of appeal that the judge had been wrong to find that the dominant purpose of the correspondence had been for the purpose of the present litigation. They were satisfied that this was the dominant purpose and noticed, noted that there was no evidence to contradict Mr. Davies' explanation of the purpose of the correspondence. Victory Game had argued that there was a patent purpose and a latent purpose, and there was no basis for the court to treat the patent purpose as the dominant one. The Court of Appeal dismissed this argument, noting that this would have the effect of allowing the patent reason to take precedence over the substantive reason why the communication was sent, irrespective of the truth. And as we set out on the slide, Court remarked that objectively assessing the dominant purpose for a communication does not involve an objective, an objective bystander test, as it is the intention of the instigator that matters. The court quoted from the House of Lords in Three Rivers, number six, which we see on the slide, uh, with the House of Lords finding that legal professional privilege can be waived or overridden by statute, but that it can't be overridden by a uh, supposedly greater public interest. Here, the Court of Appeal found that there had been no waiver or estoppel. On the issue of alleged deception on the part of the user, the Court of Appeal said that where the person making the request is entitled to the information, then it doesn't matter to the other party why he wants that information or what he plans to do with it. They further distinguished this conduct from what they described as reprehensible behaviour in previous cases which they had been referred to. In concluding its decision, the Court of Appeal found that there was no reason for Ahuja to lose the benefit of litigation privilege by threatening litigation, even if it did not then intend to bring such, such proceedings. Further, Stradbrooks weren't deceived into handing over the documents on the basis of a misleading impression that Ahuja was not going to use those documents in the litigation against Victory Game, and that there was no obligation to tell Stradbrooks what it intended to do with the information. 
This decision is a helpful restatement of the principle that when determining the dominant purpose of a document or communication, the relevant consideration is the purpose of the person making or instigating the document and which is to be determined objectively and that it is not necessary to consider the understanding of the recipient of the communication. It provides a further helpful reminder that legal privilege is absolute unless there's been a waiver or a stop or, um, in relation to that privilege or if it has been overridden by statute. Whilst the actions of Ahuja were not condoned, key issue seemed to be that Ahuja was entitled to the information which it, it had requested and that its conduct did not fall into the reprehensible category as had been seen in previous cases. The next case we'll look at now deals with the issue of without prejudice privilege. In Jones and Leiden, the High Court was asked to rule on an interim application for the disclosure of letters within the chain of correspondence marked without prejudice and where the final letter in this series was not marked without prejudice. The rationale for the without prejudice communications being treated as privileged and non-disclosable is set out on the slide, i.e. to allow the parties to explore settlement without the fear of those discussions being referred to in the court proceedings. The key question in this case was first whether the final letter in the series of correspondence was protected by without prejudice, even though it, it had not been labelled without prejudice. And secondly, whether the respondent's silence to that final letter was also privileged in these circumstances. The judge also explored the possibility of dissecting without privileged uh, documents into privileged and non-privileged parts. <clears throat> Turning to the facts of the case, a dispute between the members of the Sex Pistols arose in early September 2014 in respect of the division of money arising out of the T-Mobile advert, which features Sid Fishers performing in a concert. All the letters in the chain of negotiation were marked without prejudice. By mid-September 2014, a separate issue arose concerning the future decisions of the band and whether they were to be made unanimously or by a majority vote. At the time of negotiations, a 1998 agreement was discovered. And by virtue of the 1998 agreement, the band and their managers had agreed that all future decisions regarding the band's property will be made by a majority vote. For John Lydon, who was the applicant in this case, the 1998 agreement was problematic because he wanted all future decisions to be unanimous. It is correspondence relating to the second dispute on the future decisions that the applicant wanted to rely on in the main proceedings. The difficulty was that they were embedded within correspondence already marked without prejudice. We'll first look at the question of dissecting without prejudice correspondence into privileged and non-privileged parts, as this was the basis that the application sought to build as a stopper case. On the 26th of September, the new issue of decision-making was introduced within a WP letter already negotiating the T-Mobile dispute. Leiden argued that the 26th of September letter was dealing with two topics, the first being the original argument related to T-Mobile, which was marked without prejudice, and then this new dispute on how future decisions will be made between the band. He argued that the without prejudice marking was to protect the original dispute only, and any communications regarding the separate issue of the decisions of the band were not protected by without prejudice privilege. The judge was quick to dismiss the submission on the basis that he concluded that, as we see on the slide, a second dispute clearly flowed from the original dispute. And this finding made it harder for the applicant to disclose any correspondence relating to the second dispute, in particular the January email, which we'll look at shortly. In dismissing the applicant's submission on dissection, the court relied upon Lord Justice Robert Walker's judgment in Unilever that only in exceptional cases or circumstances should WP correspondence be dissected into privileged and non-privileged parts. Walker LJ pointed out the practical difficulties and counterproductive impact dissection would have on the principles of privilege. And on this point, the court suggested that a WP letter may contain material that was essentially a new matter, which would in effect be treated as a separate letter considered to be a dissection, but this is not the case here. We now reach the 16 January email. And in this email, the applicant's lawyer challenged the validity of the 1998 agreement with the aim of negotiating unanimous voting for future decisions rather than majority decisions as drafted. And crucial to this case is that this email, despite flowing from a chain of WP letters, was not marked without prejudice. To make things more interesting still, the respondent's lawyers never responded to this email. The applicant sought to rely on this email and the other side's failure to respond to it from, to form the crux of his estoppel case. The applicant's argument remained that the question of future decisions had nothing to do with the original debate on monies, and so any correspondence discussing the 98 agreement was not protected by without prejudice privilege. The court's ruling, however, remained that dissection is not appropriate here. And when addressing the omission of without prejudice in the email heading, 
The applicant simply argued that the email was not properly marked without prejudice, and so it wasn't protected by without prejudice privilege. The court dealt with this point in short order by referring to the 1992 High Court case of Cheddar Valley Engineering and Chadwood Holmes, which confirmed that without prejudice correspondence is to be treated as being made without prejudice unless clearly and unambiguously expressed otherwise. Just because the magic words without prejudice line of the email did not mean that the email was not to be treated as uh, being without prejudice. Interestingly, the court also played, placed great importance on the fact that the 16 January email was clearly a response to a previous letter marked without prejudice, and on the, this basis, WP protection is maintained. The applicant also argued that the respondent's silence to the 16 January email was also not protected by without privilege, given that the letter itself was not privileged. The respondents argued in return that the letter was without prejudice, and so the letter and the non-response was also clearly without prejudice. The applicant relied on the exception identified by Robert Walker L.J. Newweaver by arguing that silence to the email was in fact acceptance to its contents, that is, all future decisions are to be made unanimously. The respondent relied on Roth J's judgment in Barclay that silence is a very far cry from a clear and unambiguous statement. Relying on one party's silence would work against the principles of without prejudice protection, uh, particularly in encouraging open and constructive negotiations. The court was quick to support and apply this rubric to the current case and stated that the intention of the parties must be uh, judged objectively. It was obvious in these circumstances that the silence to this email was not a subject, statement of acceptance that the applicant was able to rely on in the future. Again, the court placed importance on the need for a clear and unambiguous uh, statement, and it was held that silence is simply not enough. A point to note here is that the applicant also sought to argue for disclosure based on the waiver exception, and the fact that to withhold such letters would not be fairly justiciable. The judge was quick to dismiss these submissions based on the key finding that the email was in fact without prejudice, without prejudice privilege. Key points to take from this case are firstly, to make any intention that you may have to depart from without prejudice correspondence clear and unambiguous so that the other party can be no doubt as to your intention. The other side must be aware of your intention and must accept and act on that intention. Simply omitting the without prejudice label from the correspondence may not be clear enough. Finally, it should be remembered that privileged and non-privileged uh, parts should ideally be dealt with in separate correspondence if the court will be slow to allow the dissection of without prejudice correspondence into privileged and non-privileged parts. So lastly, we'll look at the case of Sci-Farm and an NHS Foundation Trust. In this case, the court was asked to make an order allowing for the disclosure and inspection of privileged documents. Just looking briefly at the background, the parties had entered into a pharmaceutical development agreement. The claimant alleged that the defendant was in breach as it had lost its good manufacturing status, and that as a result, the parties were unable to enter into a subsequent commercial manufacturing agreement with one another for a particular product. The claimant alleged that it had suffered loss as a result. It was agreed by the parties in the proceedings that the subjective intention of the parties was a relevant issue, even though the judge, the judge expressed, expressed reservations as to why this should be the case and why the ordinary rules of contractual construction should not apply. In the proceedings, the claimant served a witness statement from Mr. Beckers. As we see on the slide, the defendant asserted that in Mr. Beckers' witness statement, there was a specific allusion to attendance notes or similar documents arising from the claimant's solicitor's discussions with a Margaret Beveridge. Ms. Beveridge was an employee of the defendant who was involved in negotiations with the claimant about the development of the pharmaceutical product, which is the subject of the proceedings. In Mr. Beckers' witness statement, he had referred to discussions between Ms. Beveridge and the claimant's solicitors. After the disclosure application had been made, the claimant disclosed a statement which had been obtained from Ms. Beveridge three years beforehand. The defendant asserted that her statement was inconsistent with what the claimant had said she had told the claimant's solicitors. The defendant therefore sought inspection of attendance notes arising from the claimant's solicitors' discussions with Ms. Beveridge. The defendant made this request pursuant to CPR 31.14, which is set out on the slide. This provides that a party may inspect a document which has been mentioned in various litigation documents, including a statement of case, or as in this case, a witness statement. The first question to be determined was whether the attendance notes have been mentioned in Mr. Becker's witness statement within the meaning of CPR 31.14. The judge accepted that the relevant test was whether there had been a sufficiently direct allusion to the document 
in the body of the witness statement concerned. Apologies. It was submitted that information in Mr. Becker's witness statement must have been taken from an attendance note, as there was an implicit reference to material supplied sometime around the time when the witness statement had been prepared three years previously. It was submitted that it was unreal to suggest that the claimant's solicitor could have recalled this information without the help of an attendance note. The counter argument was that there was no express reference to the document in the witness statement and that CPR 31.14 was therefore not engaged. As we see on the slide, the judge decided that in the absence of an express explanation on how the information came to be recorded and put in the witness statement, it must have been the case that it must have been recorded by reference to an attendance note and it was unrealistic to suggest that it was based on memory given the amount of time that had passed. This was sufficient for the documents to have been treated as mentioned for the purpose of 31.14. Having decided that the attendance note had been mentioned for the purposes of 31.14, the next question for the judge to decide was whether he should exercise his discretion and order the disclosure of the attendance notes, which were otherwise protected by litigation privilege. The judge referred to the judgment in Magnesium Electron and Neo Chemicals, which quoted from a leading textbook as set out on the slide. And the issue is whether a party is taken to have deployed material which would otherwise be privileged and whether the contents of the document are being relied upon. In Siphon, the judge concluded that in his witness statement, Mr. Beckers had been attempting to rely on the material, i.e. the attendance notes, rather than simply making a passing reference to the existence of the documents. This was demonstrated by Mr. Beckers setting out what he says uh, was Ms. Beveridge's comments on a certain issue. The last question for the judge to consider was whether it would be unfair to allow the party making the disclosure not to reveal the whole of the relevant information because it would risk the court and the other party only having a partial and possibly misleading understanding of the material. The judge accepted the defendant's position that because there was conflicting accounts in the witness statements of Mr. Beckers and Ms. Beveridge, it would be unfair if all materials impliedly mentioned in Mr. Beckers' statement were not disclosed and he therefore ordered that those materials should be disclosed. This is a very helpful reminder of the need to take great care on the issue of waiver of privilege when preparing pleadings or witness statements. This was not a case in which a party had made clear and express reference to a privileged document and was therefore at obvious risk of a waiver argument and the possibility of having to disclose those documents. Instead, the judge inferred from the facts that underlying attendance note had been referred to and were therefore implicitly referred to in the witness statement and that this was sufficient for the documents to be treated as having been mentioned, and therefore disclosable. Each of the cases that we've looked at this morning serve as a useful reminder for all of us to give very careful consideration to privilege issues in various aspects of our day-to-day -day work. Where you're faced with a situation around creation of new documents or reports in a contentious situation, if give careful thought as to the test for litigation privilege and whether these tests are likely to be met, or whether there is a significant risk that the documents to be prepared may not be protected by litigation privilege. In terms of without prejudice discussions, you may be having with your counterparty, give careful thoughts as to whether each communication and future communications to these ends are in fact without prejudice, and if they are, to mark them accordingly. Where there are without prejudice matters and entirely separate matters which are not privileged that are in play, separate your communications out on these matters rather than putting them in single communications so that there is less risk of arguments as to whether or not those matters are indeed separate. Finally, when preparing pleadings or statements for court proceedings, be alive to the risk that even if you do not make express reference to privileged documents, the court may nevertheless be prepared to make an inference that privileged documents have been referred to and therefore impliedly mentioned for the purpose of CPR and therefore risking their disclosure. That concludes the presentation this morning, so thank you very much for joining.